Everyone and welcome to episode 204 of the True Crime All the Time podcast. I'm Mike Ferguson, and with me, as always, is my partner in True Crime, Mike Gibson. Gibby, how are you? Hey, man, I'm doing good. How about you? I'm doing great. All right, buddy, are you ready to get into this episode of True Crime All the Time? I'm all ready. We have a story about Ryan Jenkins, but it's also a story about reality TV. You and I talked in a recent episode, I think it was about MTV. And their switch from music videos to reality television. Right. And it kind of made me think of this case. Yeah, I used to really enjoy MTV back in the day when it was just like music videos. That was, for me, that was a lot of fun to watch that, you know, just have those play over and, you know, see the videos and musicians and things like that. But now it's just like. You You don't get that. You don't get that. Well, the case today is not MTV. It's more about shows that were on VH1 because they went the same way. Well, sure they did. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you remember like the 2000s, really all of the 2000s, that was like the reality show boom. And, you know, people just couldn't get enough of reality TV. And there was no shortage of people willing to try out, right? To be a contestant on oh. all of these different kind of, some of them very strange reality shows. I think what really strikes me is how many people think about what it's like for the contestants on some of these shows. You know, if you think about the people that were on the first Survivor, they got pretty famous there. Yeah, they did. Kind of instantly. Yeah. You know, but what about all the others there has to be some that are very traumatic experiences. You know, you're on the screen, people are recognizing you at some point, you don't win whatever show it is, right? You're kicked off or you're voted off or whatever happens. And maybe it doesn't make you look that great. Well, sure. Especially how the editing goes, right? Of Mm -hmm. those shows. But I can think of some people on big brother. Yes. And, uh, survivor. That just didn't turn out well, like you you were starting to mention there. Yeah, well, I think for some people, you're at your highest point, and then the show comes out. Yeah. You're kind of at your lowest point when you're viewed as a failure or you're humiliated. And I think there are a lot of people that probably don't have the necessary coping skills to deal with, you know, some of those experiences. And to me, that's kind of a big part of this story right? Getting that reality show fame, getting close to making your dreams come true. And then the breakdown that can occur when you fall short. And, and it's not just you falling short. We all fall short. Everybody is seeing you because it's on tape, right? So this story starts with a woman named Megan Hauserman. Megan was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1981 She graduated from the University of Illinois at Chicago with a degree in accounting in 2005. Megan was five foot 10. She was blonde and she began modeling for Playboy the year after she graduated from college. Okay. She was quickly voted the Playboy Cyber Girl of the Week. In 2007, Megan began appearing on a number of reality television shows. In quick succession. I mean, she was on one after the other. Basically, she was on and won a contest type reality show called Beauty and the Geek in 2007. Kind of think I remember that show. Yeah. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, these were all VH1 reality shows. She walked away with $125,000 for that win. In 2008 alone, she was on three different reality shows. Rock of Love with Brett Michaels. Remember that one. Which which most people will remember. And I did see Brett Michaels uh, not that long ago at Best Buy, if you remember. I remember that, yeah. She was on one called I Love Money. And then Rock of Love Charm School. I kind which, of remember that one, too. Which was, which was an offshoot. Yeah. With the, had Sharon Osbourne on it. I don't really remember the whole thing. But now she didn't win any of those. But 
she was having a good time. She was soaking up the spotlight. She enjoyed that, right? She was getting a lot of attention. It was free publicity. Sure, sure. Now, she did get into a fight with, uh, with Sharon Osbourne on Charm School. Well, that's ever good to get in a fight with Sharon Osbourne. No. Now, it's not good from a standpoint that Sharon Osbourne would probably kick your ass. Yeah. I wouldn't mess with her. I wouldn't either, man. But I do think Megan sued her and, oh. and got a settlement at some point. Yeah. So. She's got all that Aussie money. Well, she's got her own money, too. Well, she's she does. on uh, yeah. one of those talk shows or something. Yeah, she's, she's got her own success as well. Plus, she has that really good British accent. <laughs> British. In 2009, Megan's place in the spotlight was set to get much bigger when VH1 offered her her own reality dating contest show. It was called Megan Wants a Millionaire. And the premise of the show was to bring in 17 millionaires to vie for the affection of Megan Hauserman. Boy, that's a lot of egos in one room. That's a lot of money, too. And a lot of money, too. She stated in interviews that the idea for the show was born out of a comment she made on Rock of Love Charm School, where she said that she wanted to be a trophy wife. She also said that once she found her millionaire, all she wanted to do was play tennis, drink wine, sit in hot tubs, and travel. I know I've heard you say all of those same exact things. Exactly. That's all I want out of life right there. So they started casting for this show, right? And they were focusing on single men with a net worth over $1 million. And when you say someone's a millionaire, I think there can be some discrepancies in how you account for that between different people. Yeah. And how you determine what a true millionaire makes a big difference in my book. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking liquid cash versus real estate, holdings, net worth, however right. you calculate it. Megan Once a Millionaire began taping in February of 2009 with the first episode premiering on August 2nd, 2009. As taping began, you know, Megan started to get to know the contestants. It was pretty clear to other people that one stood out from the beginning. Good looking, smooth talking guy by the name of Ryan Jenkins. Contestants on the show later said that they could tell right away that Megan had an initial attraction to Ryan. Each contestant was given a nickname on the show, and Jenkins earned the nickname Smooth Operator. Smooth Operator. Nice. You wanted to sing that, didn't as, you? As uh, Sade would say. Yeah. Well, some Sade. Or I used to say Sade. Sade. <laughs> Or Sadie. Sadie. It wouldn't shock me at all if that's yeah. how you... I was like, hey, DJ, put some Sadie on. If you did pronounce it They're that like, way. there's no such thing as Sadie. I'm like, yes, smooth operator. So in Ryan's bio for the show, he claimed to be the kind of person that couldn't turn, quote, player girls into princesses. His bio also listed his net worth at $2.5 million. But again, that's why he kind of made the statement about net worth his would definitely come into question with many people saying Ryan Jenkins didn't have that kind of money right? that he told others he had. Now his father had money and friends said Ryan kind of just took on the persona of his dad. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. Like a rich kid who doesn't really have the money. So he's walking in his dad's shadow, but is you know, has that air about him as right. though he does living like he does and living or portraying to live. Right. Cause there's a difference there too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Especially in the days of social media, you know, there, there are quite a few cases where you'll find people making themselves more interesting or appearing to be more wealthy than what they are, really are. Oh, no it's doubt It's kind of easy it. to do through social media. Oh, yeah. You can definitely be something that you're not, right, mm -hmm. in all aspects. Yeah, I just think about the case of Luca Magnata, which we haven't covered yet, but I know part of his thing was he would stand next to really expensive cars, Yeah, have his picture taken, and then it would be like, oh, this is my car. This is my car. No, it's not. You just stood next to it. Yeah. He'd Photoshop himself maybe into a picture. I still go down to the Wright Brothers mansion mm -hmm. in Kettering, Oakwood area. 
and I take my picture there every now and then and just put it out. Send it out on your Christmas yeah. card. Is yeah, just me out here checking my mail because you know they won't let you up in the yard. So I like, <laughs> buy the mailbox that's meanwhile sealed. There's, there's people running out with shotguns. Yeah. So let's talk about Ryan. Ryan Jenkins was a 32 year old Canadian real estate developer who, as I mentioned, came from a wealthy family. He grew up in Calgary and had the privilege of an expensive private school education. His father, Dan Jenkins, was a well-known architect, and the two of them, father and son, worked together on several projects. Ryan Jenkins listed on his resume that he was the president of a development company, in addition to working as a sales consultant for an investment firm that specialized in commercial real estate. Okay, so right off the bat, to me, this is dad made it. I'm going to follow in his footsteps and kind of soak it in. Sure. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. There are a lot of people that follow in a mother or father's footsteps. Absolutely. And take over the family business or, or whatever it is. Right. I'm not saying anything bad about that. No. What I get the sense of from Ryan Jenkins was that he he wanted the glitz and the glamour and the money. I'm not really sure how much he wanted to do the work. Yeah, he did he really put the work into it to get that? He just wanted the spoils, right. is, is the sense that I got. Yeah. Ryan also had his pilot's license, and he taught flying lessons in Calgary. But really, everything changed for Ryan Jenkins when he decided to fly to Mexico after accepting an invitation to be on that reality show, Megan Wants a Millionaire. Taping of the show wrapped in March of 2009. So when it was all done, Megan and the contestants went their separate ways. And as I'm sure they do on all these reality shows, they awaited the show's premiere, which was supposed to be in August. Yeah. Ryan Jenkins headed to Las Vegas where he quickly met a woman named Jasmine Fiore. The pair had a whirlwind romance, and they got married in one of those Vegas wedding chapels. One of those roadside or... Yeah, literally like days after they met. Right. It happened very quickly. Well, I think any marriage in Vegas happens. <laughs> well, some of those do. Some people go to they Vegas do. to get married. They do. And some people get married while they're in Vegas. Exactly. Those are two completely different things. Ryan and Jasmine had the same February 8th birthday, something that Jasmine reportedly thought meant that they were destined to be together. She had told people that. Yeah, well, I can see that. People would find Be that. Believe in things yeah, like that. Yeah. But there have been many people who have questioned exactly what type of marriage this was. There have been allegations that the marriage was one of convenience and money. People have said that, Okay, Ryan Jenkins needed to get married to be able to stay in the United States. It's been said by some that Jenkins promised Jasmine Fury a serious amount of money to marry him so he could get his citizenship. Now we know that happens. There are green so quote unquote green card marriages, they yeah, call them. Sure. And I'm not a hundred percent sure whether or not that is true, but that's an allegation that's been made by some. Jasmine Fury. Born Jasmine Lepore, grew up in Bonnie Dune, California, small community near Santa Cruz. Her father left the family when Jasmine was only 11. She was described by friends and family as a beautiful person inside and out, but she was also described as a very driven person that, you know, this was a, a woman who from an early age had a plan for everything that she did. Mm, you know, some people need that. They need to no, this is my, where I'm going to be at four years from now, five years from now, whatever, mm -hmm. 10 years from now. Or just tomorrow. Or just tomorrow. This is what I have to do to get through the day. Yeah. There are people that plan out, you know, everything meticulously. And then there yeah. are people like me who basically fly by the seat of their pants. I've always been like that. The biggest procrastinator ever. That is very true. Yeah. Jasmine's mother would later say that the whole family called her General Jasmine from like the age of three. She knew what she wanted. And she basically had it all laid out as to how to get there. Because, I mean, I think very early on, Jasmine realized that she wanted to be famous. Friends have said that she had an idea that her beauty could help her make her dreams come true. So in 2003, 
Jasmine set out for San Diego to embark on a modeling career. And, you know, reportedly Gibbs, she did everything she could to enhance her natural beauty, including getting breast implants. This is similar to your story, Mm -hmm. except you got calf implants. Yes. Yes. I did. Yeah. But I have done everything to enhance my natural beauty. Yes. But this is also around the time when she took the last name Fiore. By 2006, at the age of 25, she moved to Las Vegas and very quickly found work at some of the biggest hotels on the Strip. Jasmine was doing some modeling. She was shooting commercials and was seen hanging on the arm of some famous people out in Vegas. There were also reports that she made money being painted at parties. I never heard of this before. Body paint? Well, I've heard of body paint. I've never heard of hiring somebody to paint. Well, I know they went through that period of time where they would paint. So they'd have girls nude. They would have painters come in and paint them with that type of paint that looked like they actually had clothes on, but they didn't have clothes on. Yeah, I got this to be more of a... Pay to paint? Pay to paint to touch Oh, okay. type deal. Yeah. Jasmine was working in LA at this time, as well as Las Vegas. So she was traveling back and forth between the two regularly. She dated a series of wealthy men. Gibbs, there really was no shortage of men that wanted to be around Jasmine Fiore. She was a model. Attractive. Attractive. She had a magnetic personality. Right. Men were drawn to her. That much is true. That also included Ryan Jenkins. Yeah. But the extremely quick marriage between Ryan and Jasmine that I talked about, it was troubled from the start. In the beginning, Jasmine told some friends that Ryan was everything that she had been looking for in a man. But I think that wore off very quickly because Ryan Jenkins had a past that Jasmine was not aware of. And that past was not discovered by the, the screening people. Whoever did the conducted the screening process on the Megan once a millionaire show, they didn't get it either. In 1999, Jenkins went to a previous girlfriend's house and broke a picture on the wall when he saw another man with her inside the house. So this is a very jealous guy. Right. He was charged with breaking and entering, but he pleaded out to mischief, causing property damage. And he got, you know, a little bit of community service, which he did. Then in January of 2007, Ryan Jenkins was convicted of assault against his girlfriend in Calgary. He was sentenced to 15 months probation and was also ordered to attend court mandated counseling for both sex addiction and domestic violence. So I think these incidents kind of give you a little window right. into maybe what this guy That's- had going on. Probably not the type of guy that you want to be on your dating reality show. Right. If you knew about it. Right. And you would think as part of a screening process, that would be information that you could get your hands on. And for whatever reason, they didn't. They just didn't look in the criminal backgrounds. No. And it, you know, we probably won't talk about it much in the episode, but it does come up later on. Yeah. I think they even got sued after, you know, we find out what happens with Ryan Jenkins. I think that's the problem too. Like when you go fast and furious into a relationship and you're married that quick, you don't have time to know each other. Well, not in, a, not in a matter of days. I mean, do you really know someone even after six months, a year? Not really. Man, there, are, there are things that you find out 20 years into a marriage, yeah. and I can attest to that. I mean, I could, I could say you don't even know me that well after 12 years. That's true. Now, I know a lot about you. <laughs> it's because you're a stalker. Exactly. But I think just... You know, judging from these couple of incidents, you get that sense, right? This is a very jealous person. It also tells you that this is a guy that was capable of physically assaulting women because he had done it. Yeah. This is somebody that I would think most women, if not all, would choose not to be in a relationship. I mean, some people like that jealous stuff. They like to see somebody kind of jealous, but not like this 
kind. Oh, I get what you're saying. Some people like to see the jealousy because it proves that yeah that they're you know in love with them right or you know it makes them think oh you know he or she whichever side you're looking at they love me and that's that's why they would get jealous right but not this type of jealousy no because he's taking it out on his partner exactly nobody wants that no No. but i think within a month of the marriage jasmine began to see some of these things in ryan surface he was both physically and verbally abusive to Jasmine. It was rumored that the pair often fought over money because Jenkins, this self-proclaimed millionaire, yeah, he never seemed to have any. <laughs> so, you know, you could see why maybe your partner might get upset if they're footing the bill for everything. And here you've portrayed yourself as this, uh, this millionaire. Yeah. I mean, here he is lying about who he really is. On top of that, he's abusive. It's timely that we're talking about this with it being Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Yeah, it definitely is. Now, we shouldn't only be talking about it this month. i That's one thing I always kind of think about, right? Right. We have a month for this and a month for that. I get it. We need that. Yeah. But at the same time, shouldn't we be hammering on it each and every day, every month? Absolutely. Not waiting until... You know, this month to talk about breast cancer and this month to talk about domestic violence. But I get it. We, you know, we have to do it that way. But you're, you're absolutely right. It is timely. And I don't think Jasmine confided in anyone, her friends or family, you know, in the beginning about this domestic violence. But the rage within Ryan Jenkins, it kept bubbling up. And it really surfaced in a public setting at a Las Vegas hotel pool. Ryan was extremely jealous of Jasmine's former boyfriends, many of whom she stayed in contact with. We already know this guy's jealous. Right. That's going to, that's something that's probably going to make him jealous. Sure. It's his history. And he became enraged when he saw Jasmine with a former boyfriend. Now they were making out from the reporting that, that I saw And he confronted her near the pool. The exchange got heated. And at one point, Ryan hit Jasmine and pushed her into the pool fully clothed. She filed a domestic violence complaint against Ryan after the incident. So this marriage was already on the rocks, right? It wasn't going well early on. Right. This surely didn't help it. I mean, it's it's never going to help a marriage when one partner is is physically abusive against the other no can do nothing but damage it's not definitely not going to turn around and, and, and be a great relationship after that no and then i think to further deteriorate the marriage jasmine walked in on ryan having sex with another woman i think those are deal breakers for most women it really is for most people when you put the two together right physical abuse Now you're cheating. And that was it for Jasmine. She walked away. Ryan Jenkins eventually received a court date in December for the domestic violence charge. But that was a court date that he would never make. He did latch on to another reality show opportunity, landing a spot on season four of the show. I love money. Taping began in June of 2009. This was also in Mexico and it wrapped up in August. During the taping of the show, Ryan stayed in touch with Jasmine and he was just continually professing his love for her, trying to get her to come back to him. He sent her an email on July 27th, 2009 that read, if you can come back to me and stop all the craziness, we can have a wonderful life. Your forgiveness, trust, and loyalty is all I need right now. And when your love for me grows and our lives are heading in the right direction, I'll truly feel complete. I will never leave you. I only want you. All right. Can we break that down just a little bit? I think we need to. He's trying to win her back. And in the process, he says, if you can just stop all the craziness. Yeah. I just, I didn't understand that. How is that trying to win somebody back? By calling them crazy yeah where where are you 
apologizing for y- how you treated her. The cheating, the physical abuse. The mental no. abuse. He's not. He's basically saying, hey, if you can stop all your shit, we can make this work. Yeah, life will be good again because it's all you. And we're going to see that again down the road. That's kind of his. Uh, that's kind of his thing. Ryan Jenkins walked away from this show as the winner of season four, and he won two hundred fifty thousand dollars. It's a pretty good little chunk of change. Yeah, not bad. But the show was not set to air until January of two thousand ten. So, you know, if you think about it, Ryan had spent a bunch of time, a large part of two thousand nine, in Mexico taping two different reality shows this i love money and megan wants a millionaire now he was riding pretty high after winning the two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and i believe he was hoping to use that to help in his you know reconciliation efforts with jasmine because they did reconcile when jenkins returned to the u.s after taping the show And I think one thing that is interesting, as we go through the timeline of events, Ryan's visa was set to expire at the end of August. On August 2nd, Megan Wants a Millionaire premiered. It was said that Ryan and Jasmine, who were back together, they enjoyed the notoriety that the show brought. It kind of makes people famous a little bit, to, to whatever degree of fame you get. But you're on a television show. People are recognizing you. The thing is, you have to wonder what Ryan Jenkins was thinking during this time, because unlike everybody sitting on their couch at home, he already knew how the show ended. Yeah. It was going to come out for the whole world to see that he didn't win this contest. He wound up finishing third on the show. And I think to a guy like Ryan, a lot of people have theorized that that was going to be a huge letdown. Right. This is a guy with a big ego. It couldn't have been easy for him to deal with something like that. Because that famous saying, man, if you ain't first, you're last. That famous saying that you got from Talladega Nights? Shake and bake, baby. <laughs> Shake and bake. I think we're going down a bad path. Yeah. But here's the thing. The world was never going to see this play out on television because Megan Once a Millionaire was never going to be aired in its entirety. So we talked about Jasmine Fury. She had always maintained contact with her exes. And during the time that she and Ryan were apart, she reportedly took a vacation with her ex-fiance, Robert Hasman. Even after Jasmine and Ryan reconciled, she reportedly visited her ex-husband on August 12th after he got released from jail. Photos later came out of the two of them kissing on the beach. So again, This is all leading up to what is a person like Ryan Jenkins, who we've already set the stage is a, is an extremely jealous person, right? What is this going to lead to? Can't be good. No, it's not going to be good, but we have to kind of set all of these things up the very next day, August 13th, Ryan and Jasmine were together in San Diego. They checked into the LaBerge Del Mar Hotel around 3.30 in the afternoon. Then they drove to another hotel, the San Diego Hilton, which was about 20 minutes away, to play in a poker tournament. Jenkins and Fiore were seen leaving the San Diego Hilton at 2.30 in the morning. This is the last time that anyone would see Jasmine Fiore alive. Jenkins arrived alone to the Del Mar Hotel at 4.30 in the morning, and then he checked out alone the next morning at 9.30 a.m. The body of Jasmine Fiore was found nude in a suitcase that had been thrown into a dumpster in Buena Park, California, a few days later in the early morning hours of August 15th. She had been strangled, and there were signs Gibbs that she had put up a fight for her life. I believe her nose was broken. Yeah. Yeah. Her nose was broken. The problem that the police had was when they found the body, they couldn't make an identification. This was because all of Jasmine's teeth had been removed. And all her fingers were cut off as well. Now, why would someone do that? Exactly for the reasons why the police can't identify who the body belongs to. Yeah, my thoughts exactly. I mean, why would you do those two things, remove teeth and and fingers, 
unless you're trying to prevent police from identifying the body. And I think to me, this is an act that really shows how cold and calculating the killer was. And that killer, you know, allegedly it was Ryan Jenkins. So not only did he allegedly murder the person that he said he loved, but he pulled out her teeth and cut off her fingers. That That's a monster. It is a monster. And there has to be some type of preparation for that, right? I mean, you got to have some tools. tools. Yeah. I mean, you're not just most likely pulling something out of your back pocket. Right. That you just happen to have on you. You're bringing tools with you to to make that happen. And I guess, Gibbs, I, I have to use the word allegedly. I hate to do it, but I have to for reasons that will become clear later on. But here's what Ryan Jenkins didn't know. And it was that investigators would find another way to make a positive identification. They did it by obtaining the serial number from Jasmine's breast implants. Yeah, people forget that those numbers are on. Um, items like that. I mean, I know you know because you had your one testicle replaced and you have that serial number on that one. Mm -hmm. Thanks for letting that out of the bag. Oh, yeah. I I thought we talked about it once before. Maybe we didn't. But in seriousness, you bring up a good point. A lot of things that are implanted medically contain a serial number. Yeah. And that serial number can be traced back. And it has been in, you know, a number of different cases, not just breast implants, but you know, other things that are used in medical procedures. But once they had that information, they were able to figure out that the breast implants belong to Jasmine Fiore. But there were some other things done to try to throw investigators off. You know, Ryan Jenkins called friends asking if they knew where Jasmine was. He called family and said, oh, you know what? Jasmine's run off. She's left me again. Trying to set the stage. Mm Mm-hmm. I think even more cunning was that he used Jasmine's phone to send out texts, making it seem as though she was still alive. She was still communicating with people, but she wasn't. It was him trying to throw police off. The night that Jasmine's body was found, Ryan Jenkins reported her missing to police. He told police that he hadn't heard from her since they returned from their trip in to San Diego the day before his story was that she dropped him off at their apartment and went to run some errands. And she said she was going to get her nails done. Probably to coincide with all his text messaging and things like that. A few days later, Jasmine's white Mercedes was discovered not far from the couple's apartment. The interior of the car was covered in blood. So obviously right away, investigators knew that something terrible happened inside that car. They found a letter from Ryan to Jasmine in the glove box of the car, which kind of pointed out the fact that the two had an extremely rocky relationship. So police were investigating the death of Jasmine Fury, and they began to look at Ryan Jenkins as their prime suspect. It didn't take them long, Gibbs, to figure out that The story Jenkins had been telling just couldn't be true. They got the surveillance tape from both hotels that Ryan and Jasmine were at on the night of August 13th and into the early morning hours of the 14th. They saw Ryan and Jasmine leave the Hilton at 2.30 in the morning. They saw Ryan return alone to his hotel at 4.30 in the morning. And then they saw him leave alone from the Del Mar at 9.30 on the 14th. What they didn't see was Jasmine either returning to the hotel or leaving the next morning. And there lies the problem. That's a big, that's a big problem. Yeah. And then police found Jasmine's blood and hair on the patio of their hotel room. So they theorized that Jenkins went back out to the car and brought Jasmine's body into the hotel room through the first floor patio entrance. Which, if he had done that, he wouldn't have been caught by the surveillance cameras. Okay. Now, cameras did catch him leaving his room several times in the middle of the night. I think at one point, he's running down the hallway. And at another point, he's got the like the phone 
in his hand. It must have been a cordless phone in the room. Police believe that Jenkins put Jasmine's body into the suitcase sometime between 4.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. The one thing that they had a hard time figuring out was whether he killed Jasmine in the car on the ride between hotels or whether he killed her once he had her back in the hotel room at the Del Mar. But surveillance cameras did catch Ryan Jenkins carrying clothing out of the hotel to the car prior to leaving that morning. So, I mean, I think that kind of goes well with the police's theory. Yeah, he had to make room in the suitcase for Jasmine's body and he had to take his clothes with him as well. Police were able to put Ryan Jenkins 90 miles away from San Diego in Corona, California after he left the hotel. They found brush underneath Jasmine's Mercedes, and they believe that Ryan may have traveled off-road to dump her clothing, her fingers, her teeth. I mean, that's it's gruesome to think about, but he's got to get rid of that stuff. And then he drove back to Los Angeles, dumping the Mercedes, and then he walked back to the apartment. But here's the thing, Gibbs. Ryan Jenkins knew that police were closing in, so he took off. He went on the run, igniting an international manhunt. He first drove to Lake Mead near Las Vegas, where he retrieved his boat. And then he drove to northern Washington. Police later found his black BMW X5 with a boat trailer attached in Blaine, Washington. When they got there, the engine of the BMW was still warm. They're right on his heels. Yeah. So they know they they just missed him by a little bit. From there, they believe that Jenkins used the boat to get to Canada and then took off on foot. On August 19th, a man saw someone matching Jenkins' description driving a boat into the marina in the border town of Point Harbor. They think he then made his way to Hope, British Columbia, about an hour from the U.S. border. So I said, you know, it's an international manhunt. Right. So now you had the Royal Canadian Police, right? joining in on the search for Ryan Jenkins. Ryan Jenkins was charged with Jasmine Fury's murder on August 20th. And the U S Marshal service offered a $25,000 reward for his capture. An arrest warrant was issued stating that Jenkins should be held in lieu of a $10 million bail. That's a lot of money. Yeah, you know, it really is. But if you think about what he was suspected of doing, right? murdering a woman, pulling out her teeth, right, removing her fingers. It's brutal. It is brutal. And we know he was a flight risk. Yeah. I mean, obviously he jumped from the U.S. into Canada. The same day that he was officially charged with Jasmine's murder, Ryan Jenkins pulled into the parking lot of the Thunderbird Motel in Hope with a young blonde woman. The woman paid cash for three nights. The Calgary Herald reported that the woman was believed to have been Ryan's half-sister who lived in Vancouver. But I don't know, Gibbs, if that's ever been verified. I've seen it reported that it's thought it was his half-sister, but I don't know if that's 100% true. The man working the desk at the Thunderbird would later say that the woman left about 20 minutes after checking in. And he never saw her again. He also told police that the man he saw around the motel over the next few days did not look like the pictures he had seen on television of Ryan Jenkins. I'm sure they splashed his PR picture up on the news. No, I'm sure they did. And, you know, to be honest, Ryan Jenkins was a good looking guy. He took care of himself. He was in good shape. But by this time, he had lost weight. He looked exhausted, nothing like the buff, good-looking guy that he had been on TV. Now, you know what will do that to you? Probably killing someone. Yeah, murder. And then going on the run, being worried about what you've done and what's going to happen when they catch up to you. Yeah. I imagine that makes it hard to sleep, hard to eat. It'll wear on you. I don't know from firsthand knowledge. You're speaking as though you do. Okay, got it. Noted. Noted. On August 23rd, when the occupants of room two failed to check out, 
the manager and his nephew went to the room. What they found inside was Ryan Jenkins hanging by a belt from a clothes rack that was mounted to the wall. He had taken his own life. Some of the accounts that I read in various newspapers said that, you know, these people, the manager and his nephew, they described the smell. I mean, the minute they opened that door, right? they knew that something was horribly wrong because they said it smelled like death. Yeah. And you and I have talked about that before. It's not something that you're going to mistake for a freshly baked cherry pie. It's no, just, it, very, it's not. It has its own distinct smell. Yeah. And, and we talked about it on the Unsolved case this week as well. Detectives searched Ryan's computer, which was in the hotel room, and they found a will that he had written three days before his suicide. Investigators looked at the will basically as a suicide note because it did provide some insight into what he was thinking as he sat in that motel room in British Columbia. In it, Ryan Jenkins put the blame on Jasmine Fiore for all his troubles. He stated in the letter that she was beautiful and that she caused him to be jealous by sleeping with former boyfriends. But nowhere in the letter does Jenkins take any responsibility for the death of his wife. And I think the fact that he doesn't even acknowledge that she's gone. Right. Or that there's a loss there, right? He has a loss To me, that tells you everything you need to know about Ryan Jenkins. Sure. And he also doesn't own up to the fact that he too cheated. Sure. And that he was abusive. Mm -hmm. Nope. And I think we kind of hinted at it earlier. This is the type of guy he is, right? Putting the blame on other people, you know, blaming her for all of his troubles. Okay. Well, did she do some things? Did she maybe sleep with former boyfriends while they were separated? Maybe. Yeah. But what is that? Uh, you're now blaming that on the fact that you needed to kill her? Yeah. If you didn't like that, if you thought that's what she was doing and you didn't care for that, then move on. Right? Yeah. They were already separated. Yeah. I don't know these people that have issues with somebody that they're trying to have a relationship with. If you don't like what's going on, leave him alone. Move on. To me, it's the fact that he says she caused him to be jealous. Again, he just is blaming other people for things that he's done. Right. And I said it. That's kind of a thing that, that'll come back around and, and, and did. Friends and family of Ryan Jenkins in Canada said that this guy that they saw on television, the smooth operator... That wasn't the same intelligent man that they knew. His mother said he's a good person and the media just made him out to look so bad. He was the best son and it was the media that had painted him as a monster. That's what she said. Now, did they paint him as a monster? Probably. Sure. Was he a monster? It sure seems like it. Well, those things that he did to her definitely makes him a monster. When I used the word allegedly before, and now we know the reason why. Right. You know, Ryan Jenkins ended his life. He knew he was about to be caught. He wanted to avoid that. He wanted to avoid that. He wanted to avoid what was going to happen after that. You know, the evidence seems to all line up, but he never sat in that courtroom in front of a jury of his peers. So... It's kind of a gray area. I mean, technically, was he ever convicted? I never found where he was. They never convicted him in absentia after death, as far as I could tell. But in the court of public opinion. Well, and and I think even more so in, in the court of police and investigators and the evidence they had, yeah. it all seems to me as, as though it pointed to the fact that he did this. But it, it's a strange situation whenever somebody dies before they're able to get a conviction right in in a court of law after jasmine's death her mother said that she planned to set up a foundation in her daughter's name and then after the murder and ryan's death and all of this stuff came out 
VH1 decided to put the show Megan Wants a Millionaire on hiatus. They had aired three episodes right. of the show. Yeah. And then ultimately they decided that, you know what? They just had to pull it all together. Yeah. How could they not? Well, you can't have a murderer on TV like yeah. that. Or a suspected murderer, yeah, however exactly. you want to say it. Yeah. So there would be no audience for the rest of the performance delivered by Ryan Jenkins. The season of I Love Money that Ryan appeared on and won was never aired. And, you know, to me gives the irony in this whole thing is that Ryan Jenkins wanted to be famous and the shows that would have helped him achieve that fame, then they were never aired because of what he did. Instead, he became infamous for taking the life of Jasmine Fiore. Yeah. So, so strange. Not the avenue anybody thought he would take, but he did. No, and I can guarantee, I can tell you his family was shocked. I, I did read a lot about, you know, his father being interviewed in different papers. And, and obviously his family didn't think he did it. But I, I think in one quote, his dad said, well, if he did do it, he's a monster. Right. But he didn't think he did it. But if he did do it, if he did everything that the police had said he did, he's a monster. Well, you look at those tapes, the timeline. Yeah, and that's what I kind of said. The evidence all lines up. Yeah. Would a jury have convicted him? I think most likely, based on the evidence that, that we know of. You know, I go back to the fact that, okay, Jasmine Fiore was someone that Ryan Jenkins was supposed to love with all his heart. I mean, he professed his love to her, but he couldn't handle his jealousy. And nor could he ever throughout his adulthood it appeared right he had showed it before yeah. but some people are like that right they, they can't handle their emotions jealousy being one of them right and or ego i mean i think you can throw a lot of those different things in the mix yeah and that fact the fact that he couldn't handle it and chose to do what he did you know it ended up robbing jasmine's family and friends of this wonderful person that they loved and that was real love to yeah. me that that wasn't the kind of love that ryan jenkins professed to have because if you if you had it you couldn't do that to somebody no you that, that's my opinion yeah you would never hurt somebody like that now could you do it accidentally sure anybody could do something accidentally right. would you then pull their teeth and cut off their fingertips no 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 you wouldn't want to do that to somebody you really loved so I mentioned that they couldn't air all of these different things that they had shot, right? With Ryan Jenkins. I think the production company, I think they ended up going bankrupt Yeah, and got sued by VH1. I mean, there was a lot of money that was lost because you think about how much money goes into production. producing an entire season of a show, lost ad revenue. I don't know, but it was, it was a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money outlay there without ever airing and getting that ad revenue coming in. So I know you found out some interesting things about Megan. Yeah, I couldn't find out much. Uh, really, the last I found on her was that she was living in Florida. She is engaged to a professional golfer or was. I think that was two th It was last year was the last article I found. Yeah. The two have a child together. Now, she does have some television credits over the years. Not a whole lot, some commercials, some some different things. But to me, it seemed as though she began concentrating more on family yeah, and raising her child. So good for her. Yeah. So, I, you know, I hope she's doing well. She obviously didn't have anything to do with this murder. The only reason she's even a part of the story is because of the reality show and the fact that Ryan Jenkins was on it. Right. There are some people that have speculated that, you know, the way that he was going to come off when that show aired all of its episodes yeah, or the way that he, maybe he thought he would come off. He didn't like, hmm. and that played a part. I, I don't know if it did, but there are people that have speculated that. I mean, he came in third. It's not like he was the first one kicked off right. and I haven't actually seen the show, but 
you know, there were some reports that maybe he wasn't real happy with the way that he was going to come off. The way he was portrayed. Yeah. Well, editing can make you or break you. Yeah. I mean, as we know, <laughs> my English is perfect, but somehow- I edited it to make it not yeah, so perfect. exactly. I thought it was an interesting story, you know, Gibbs, given the fact that you and I have been talking about reality television a little bit, um, especially MTV, this happened to be VH1, but it's a tragic story in that, you know, a woman lost her life. Right. And at the same time, this was a guy that, you know, he really had a lot of things going for him. Like we said, came from a wealthy family, had money, had a good education, could have done a lot of good things in life. Yeah. But couldn't either couldn't control his emotions, let jealousy get the better of him. Yeah. Whatever it was, something caused him to snap and kill Jasmine Fiore and then try to cover it up and go on the run and all that. But tragic. Yeah. As most of our cases are. Yeah. <laughs> There's always some tragedy involved. Yeah, sadly. Yeah. But that's it for the story of Ryan Jenkins. Are we still going to do the tryout for the True Crime Big Brother series? Yeah, I, I haven't figured out how to get it financed. Okay. But you know that'd be a good show. It would be a really good show. And the fact that you're talking about it means that somebody will steal it. Yeah. Like my... House makeover? House makeover true crime combo that somebody... Right. I'm not saying they stole it, but somebody did it. Imagine how many people are on Big Brother? 12? Uh, I think so. I don't know. I don't watch it. Something but like that. I'm assuming tw- a, a nice number like 12. Right. Imagine 12 people in a mansion. Yeah. And similar to the show or the game Clue. Yeah. The movie Clue. But, you know, you've got to solve a murder. The clues are laid out. Over a series of episodes, people would like that. People would, yeah. And the story unfolds. You get the the backstory of the characters. and Add a little twist of the Big Brother stuff in there, too, and backstabbing. and People were sleeping sleeping with other people with the lights off, but you can see it. (laughs) I've heard about that. I don't know. (laughs) So that is it for another episode of True Crime All the Time. So for Mike. And Gibby. Stay safe and keep your own time ticking.